Good morning. Um, we are going through the Lord's Prayer, um, and we've reached that part of the prayer uh, where Jesus says, uh, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. The older translations do have, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Actually, the, the, the Greek word that's used in the New Testament is uh, a word that implies obligation. And you can see why it could become debt or it could become trespass, a sense of obligation, even sin. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So this morning I want to speak about this and you'll see that the message is going to come into two parts, two, two halves. So the first part is going to be forgive us our debts and the second part is going to be as we have forgiven our debtors. So that's our forgiving other people but the first part is about God forgiving us. So, so basically it's a two-part message but it's a little bit more complicated because there will be a collective sense and an individual sense. So there is forgive us our debts, but that us includes individuals. So there's going to be an individual part as well as a collective part. And what I want to do is to talk first about the way in which human beings need forgiveness. Then I'm going to go to the Last Supper in John chapter 13 and just look at an incident there at the Last Supper and then I'm going to go to the parable of the unforgiving servant in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18. So we have a little journey ahead of us and we begin with forgive us our debts. This, this prayer for forgiveness this general prayer for forgiveness. And first, a little bit about forgiveness. This wonderful, rich word, forgive. It's something which is actually really central to Christianity. It's one of the things that Christianity is known for. Other religions really don't speak about forgiveness, but for the Christian, the notion of forgiveness is absolutely central. It's part of the faith. It's part of what Christians do. It's part of what the church is exhorted to do. It's part of the way we should live our lives, to forgive. And so we, we think about this notion of forgive us our debts. And I, I want to, to say that According to the scripture, everybody needs the forgiveness of God. Everybody. Everybody. In fact, if we, we read from the book of Romans, we read this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by, the, by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. All have sinned and fallen short. All have sinned. Every man, woman, upon the face of the earth has sinned, has fallen short of the glory of God. And that's an extraordinary statement. It implies that the human race stands before God as a human race that has fallen short of God's standards. And you might think, well, that's a bit unfair, isn't it? I mean, surely there are lots of good people. And there are lots of good people. But the scripture teaches that the human race as a whole has fallen short of the glory of God. I, I, think, I think of the way in which human beings go to war and kill each other. The way in which human beings have have attacked each other, harmed each other. I think of the way that human history is often the story of human warfare. 
Uh, I, I think, for some reason, that in 1812, on the 24th of June, the Emperor Napoleon, with an army of 600,000 people, including French, Germans, Austrians, Italians, marched into Russia. 600,000, over half a million men and horses. And they fought a campaign and only a quarter of them returned. They were slaughtered. I think of the First World War, where the total casualty figures among the military was, I believe, 9.7 million, where human beings killed each other. I, I think that the human race has not learned to live at peace with each other. I think, of, I think of crime. I think of the way in which murders are committed every day of the year. I think of the way that people treat each other. That's why the Bible says all have sinned. I think of, of crime. I was in the car park in Sainsbury's and a phone, came, a phone call came through and I answered the phone and said, uh, you have a, a, a parcel uh, which is being held up at customs and excise and you have to pay a fee to customs and excise and if you don't, we'll send the police around to arrest you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of liar is this? I, I put the phone. But I guess you've had emails every day, people telling you lies. We do live in a world in which people do harm and do wrong. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That does include the influencers on the internet, believe it or not. It does include the rock stars at Glastonbury. It does include those who are politicians who have pocketed taxpayers' money. It does include dictators. It does include the, 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 the whole human race. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there is a remedy. The remedy is found in Christ. The remedy is found in the forgiveness that is offered in Christ. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. There is a remedy. The, the scripture teaches that Christ died for the sins of the world. Christ died for the... And you say, how could that be? How can it be that Christ should die for the sins of the world? But that is what the scripture teaches, that Christ came innocent and pure, that Christ came actually as divine, and that only God could pay the debt that God owed, that Christ died upon the cross, and there is therefore in Christ the offer of forgiveness. What a thing it is to be forgiven by God. What a wonderful thing where your conscience is cleared. What a wonderful thing that I can walk with God and he's my friend, that I have been cleared. It, the, the, the scripture says actually, um, as far as the east is from the west, this is Psalm 103, so far has he removed my transgressions from me. This notion that if God forgives, he forgives. If God forgives, he forgives. I want to say to you, friends, that there is a remedy in Christ. There is a remedy. So you might say, well, why did Jesus teach us to pray if you are forgiven? Why did Jesus teach us to pray if, well, he went and died on the cross, so, so why do I need to pray, forgive us our trespasses? Why should the Christians pray this? Because if you are a Christian, then yes, you know the forgiveness of Christ. Why do we need to do this? And I, I want to address that in the next part of what I have to say. So I want to turn to 
uh, the, um, the Last Supper, and this is in John's Gospel. It's chapter 13, and I'm going to start at verse 4. So we read this. So this is the Last Supper. This is the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. There are 13 people in the room. There are the 12 disciples, and there is Jesus. And they have a meal together, and the Gospel of John tells us about that meal. It's quite a long meal. There's, things are said at that meal. And we read that uh, uh, at the end of the meal, uh, verse 4, so he got up from the meal, this is Jesus, and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. There is individual attention to each disciple by Christ. He goes round the table, one at a time, one at a time. And I want to say to you, to me, that there is individual attention by Christ to each one. To each believer, there is individual attention. He goes round to you. He comes round to me. And he comes round to wash your feet and my feet. There is the service of Christ to his disciples. There is the Son of God who performs the role of the servant. He takes a towel. He takes a base. He goes round the dirty feet of each disciple. He goes round to you. He goes round to me. And he wants to wash the feet of the individual. And he comes to Peter, and a conversation takes place. He came to Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Lord, it's not fitting. It's not right. It's not suitable. I can't, I can't let you wash my feet. You're the Lord. You, you, you're the master. You're, you're the king. How can you wash my feet? And Jesus replies, you don't realize what I'm doing, but you will later. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. It's, it's not right, it's not appropriate that you, the King, the Lord, the Savior, Jesus, should wash my feet. And Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. So then Peter gets the message. Lord, okay, wash my hands and my head. Give me a, a thorough wash, if that's what you're going to do. My hands, speaking perhaps of my actions. My head, speaking of my thoughts. Wash my hands, wash my, my head. And Jesus answered, a person who's had a bath needs only to wash his feet, his whole body is clean. I want to say that if you have come to Christ and you have put your trust in him and you have known the forgiveness that is available, you've had a bath. You have had a cleansing. You've had a renewal. You've had a sense of the past being dealt with. You've had a bath. But maybe as you walk through the dusty streets in your sandals with dust on your feet and as you pass through life, maybe there are some things that come along and your feet get grubby. And so there is a need for the feet to be washed. In other words, for the Christian who has been forgiven 
and who does something that is questionable, there is forgiveness. There is, there is a way. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So for the Christian, there is the bath. There is the initial act of forgiveness. But then there is the continuing. There is the, yes, okay, I've got my feet dirty. I walked through the mud. I need to get them clean. So, Lord, I'm going to confess this to you. I, I want to say to you, this is not a, a, not a faith of, of misery and gloom and doom. This is, a, this, is a, this is a way of dealing with practical problems that occur as we go through life. Your feet need a wash. All right, Lord, thank you that you're willing to wash my feet. I want to say again, what a remarkable thing that Christ, individually, for you and for me, should be taking the trouble to act as a servant. It says in Scripture, he came to not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So then, the forgiveness that we receive from God. But what about the way it's going to work with regard to others? How do we treat other people if we have been forgiven? I want to say that the church is a body of forgiven people. The church is a forgiven body, but it's also a forgiving body. Forgiven and forgiving. So let us turn to the parable of the unmerciful servant. And we're going to find that in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. And I'll, I'll read it to you in case you, have, you don't know it or have forgotten it. So I'm going to start at verse... Uh, well, I'm sort of verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus, this is Matthew 18, and asked him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? You know, in other words, I've got trouble with my brother. I've got trouble with another Christian. I've got trouble with this person. How many times should I forgive him? Up to seven times? You know, that's pretty generous, eh? Jesus said, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. <laughs> Don't lose count. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven... Is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, a, a talent is a weight, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a big sum of money. It, it doesn't really matter exactly what it is, but it's a, it's a big weight of gold. 10,000 talents. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So here is the picture of the first part. Here is the king. He's calling his servants and he finds a servant here who owes him an astronomical amount of money. I mean, more money than he could earn in his lifetime. A whole whack of money. 10,000 talents. This man is absolutely in, in debt to the king. And the king, having done the accounts, looks at this. And he says, you'll have to be sold. That's into slavery. You'll have to be sold. And your family. And anything you own. It'll all have to go. I'll have to liquidate the lot. I'll have to, to send the lot away. It'll all have to be, be turned into cash. I and mean, in that way, some of the money will be recouped. And so the, the king gives the order. And the man, the man is stricken. He is horrified. Everything I've got, everything I've worked for, is all going to go. How can this be? And so the servant 
fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me. He begged, and I will pay back everything. So he falls down before the king. He falls on his knees. He begs him, please, please don't do this. Please don't sell me. Please don't sell everything I've got. Please don't put me into this, into this situation. I will pay you back. I will, I will, I will. So the king hears his cry. And the king, the servant's master, took pity on him and cancelled the debt and cancelled the debt he knew that however long he was given he'd never pay it back it was just too much so the king cancelled the debt he tore it up he, he forgot it he crossed it out you had a debt now you don't have a debt. The king said, I'll bear the loss. I'll take the loss. I'll cancel the debt. Friends, that is a picture of a, of a Christian who has come to God and asked for forgiveness. And God has said, okay, it's zero. It's nothing. You are forgiven. Friends, I want to say to you, that is a huge act of grace that is performed by the king. And every Christian can say, wow, did you do this for me? There are people who have done wrong. There are people who have committed murder. You think, you think I'm joking? You think of the apostle Paul who, before he was a Christian, went round and took men and women and brought them to prison because he was seeking to persecute the church. That's the Apostle Paul. Saul, he was called in those days. And he, he found forgiveness. He found forgiveness. Though he'd taken men and women and put them in prison, Saul, who sought to destroy the church, found forgiveness forgiveness I want to say to you friends there is forgiveness there are I remember hearing testimonies I remember hearing the New York gangster or Nicky Cruz who had been involved in drugs on knife crime on the streets of New York this is going back a bit and the preacher went and preached Dave Wilkerson preached on the streets of New York and the gangsters in New York, some of these young men who know nothing but crime, lived in their gangs, went out and robbed people, went out and knifed people, went out and sold drugs, and they found in Christ forgiveness. I remember hearing Nicky Cruz at a conference, and his life had been turned around. He came from a, he came from a home where... The name of God was only a swear word. He came from a home where there was hatred and, and horrible things. And he came and he found forgiveness. Friends, I want to tell you that you can be forgiven by God. That you can be forgiven by God. That, that if you're sitting in this room and think, you don't know what I've done. I want to tell you that it's 10,000 bags of gold that you owe. You can be forgiven. There is forgiveness. He cancelled the debt. He cancelled it. It's gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far you remove my transgressions for me. You are not under obligation. That burden of debt, that psychological burden, that, that burden of worry, that which keeps you awake at night, that has been forgiven. The God of the universe, the king in the parable that Jesus told, has wiped it out. It's gone. And I want to tell you, friends, that when God forgives, he forgives. It's a complete forgiveness. It's a wonderful forgiveness. It's a forgiveness that starts 
everything in you. Well, now, you might think, well, that's the end of the parable. But it isn't, I'm sorry to say. Because when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, that's a small amount of money. Perhaps it's three months' wages. And he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. He grabbed him. He began to choke him. He exercised physical violence. He took his fellow servant. You pay me. This is the man who'd been forgiven. You pay me. This is the man who's had a vast debt. But he doesn't show any mercy to his fellow servant. Chokes him. You pay me. And so, using almost exactly the same words that he'd used when he'd spoken to the king, the fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay back. But he refused. Instead, he went out and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt, i.e. never. Because if he's in prison, he can't earn any money and he'll never repay the debt. He had him thrown into prison. He used the law against him. And he had him thrown into prison. His fellow servant who owed him a, a pittance, a small amount of money. I want to say to you, I want to say to myself, I need to forgive. I need to forgive those who've wronged me. And I know that in a room of people like this, there will be people who have been wronged. There will be people who have been hurt. There will be people who have been exploited. There will be people who've been badly treated by somebody. Maybe by a person, maybe by an organization, maybe by a government. But you, there will be people here who have been badly treated. And you are right to think, they treated me wrong. They treated me wrong. I want to say to you that we should forgive. An act of will. And you might say, and I've just about got time to say this to you, it's an act of will. But I know that forgiveness is complicated. And I'm going to tell you a little quick story. Church I used to be at, we had a minibus years ago, a long time ago. And for some reason, I was the minibus driver. <laughs> and uh, we used to take the minibus around and collect people for church before the service. So I'm driving the minibus, people in the minibus, driving it. A car comes whizzing round the corner, scrapes along the side of the minibus and whizzes off. I'm like, what have we done? What's happened? We get to the church. The minibus has been damaged. What are we going to do? Someone has damaged our minibus. Then we say, right, we're Christians. We must forgive the person who damaged our minibus. Well, it later turned out that the driver of the car which hit the minibus was a 14-year-old boy who'd stolen the car. And he was hardly see over the steering wheel. He'd driven round, sm smashed into our car, zoomed off. And somebody in the church wisely said, yeah, we should forgive him, but he could kill somebody next time. He could knock a cyclist down. He could hit a pedestrian. So what we did was we said, OK, let the law take its course, but we as a church, we will forgive we will not pursue for damages. We will not pursue 
him because of what he's done. We will not pursue his parents. So in other words, I can see that there are complications when you forgive. Sometimes it isn't quite as easy as you hope it will be. And this was a case in point where, yes, we did forgive the young man who was a na naughty boy. I mean, more, worse than a naughty boy. I mean, he takes, pitched the car, <laughs> stole it, <laughs> driving around in it. So he was more than a naughty boy, but we didn't pursue him. We didn't prosecute him. We didn't, we didn't say we're out for him. We didn't go knocking on the door of his parents and saying, you pay for our minibus. We didn't say that. We forgave him. But we did allow the law to take its course. And I, I want to say to you, friends, that forgiveness can be complicated. But I want to say to you that forgiveness is something that we as Christians should do. This, this servant who grabbed the other servant by the throat, he failed to forgive and because he failed to forgive, it all went badly wrong because the king then sends him to prison. And I want to say to you that you don't want to end up in a prison, even in a psychological prison. You don't want to end up in any kind of prison. Friends, I want to say to you that it's for your own good to forgive others, hard though that may be. And I know that there are people in this room who have been hurt and harmed and let down and mistreated. I know that is the case. But I want to say that somehow, somehow, let your forgiveness. Now, that forgiveness means that I'm not going to seek vengeance. I'm not going to be angry. I'm going to, I'm going to seek to let it go. Sometimes we use the word forgive and forget. And I want to say to you, yes, forgive and forget. Let's look to the future. Let's look to the future. Let's forgive. Let's forget. And, and let us be following our heavenly king who forgave us a vast debt. And let us forgive others what they have done against us can the band come up may God bless you may God bless you may God help you in both parts of this prayer both to know the forgiveness of God for yourself and in the second part enable you to forgive others who have wronged you amen, amen. God bless you